So we're looking at In the One Spirit, the autobiography of Harry Vernet Rhodes, as told to Marguerite Harmon Bro. Um, we're going to continue now with chapter three. And this chapter is about lessons and leading. My father's death in April 1902 left a vacuum in my life just when I needed a strong center. In those days, the kind of married people I knew did not get divorces. I could never quite believe that the things which were happening to me and my children were actually happening to us. I was in great need of practical financial help and in need of spiritual sustenance. One day when my trouble seemed especially unbearable, a friend took me to see Dr. Julia M. Walton, who was a medical doctor with psychic gifts. I knew she was a good physician, beloved by her patients and respected in the community. As to psychic ability, I had never heard of such a thing and the word spiritualism to me was vaguely synonymous with seeing ghosts. Dr. Walton sat down beside me and I felt rested in her presence. She was a woman who had what used to be called Christian character and she lent dignity to that phrase. Her unselfish service to people in need was matched by a kind, tender understanding, which took for granted that her patient also wanted to do what was right for all concerned. Sitting there beside me, she described my father, his appearance, his mannerisms, and she gave me a message from him. All I could then comment was she certainly had described my father, whom she had never seen, and about whom she had never heard, and that the message purporting to come from him did indeed sound a lot like him. Everything she said and did seemed so reasonable that I was not then unduly impressed by her unusual gift. It was then in November 1904 that she gave me a message that my father felt it would be best for me to move from Michigan to Minnesota for the sake of the health of one of my boys who needed a different environment at once. She described the man whom I, I was going to go for advice. I made note of her words. He was your father's law partner. He is very tall and has red hair. Follow his advice and you will locate near a large lake. He will send you to another town and will be the first man you see when you arrive. At the depot will be the man to help you find the house you are to buy. He is a short man with a fringe of red hair around a big bald spot. He has, and he has a broad smile. It never occurred to me not to follow her advice. I went to St. Cloud, Minnesota and conferred with Mr. David T. Calhoun, who had been my father's law partner. He was six feet, four inches tall and had a shock of fiery red hair. He sent me to Painesville, Minnesota to see Mr. Frank Tolman, who had known my father many years before. When I got off the train at Painesville, the first man I saw on the depot platform was short, red haired, and bald on top with a great big smile. Later, I found he always had a big smile. Every detail of the place I was to buy and the price I was to pay was exactly as Dr. Walton had told me. Dr. Walton had also told me that in six years, my work would entirely change and I would begin my real life work. But when I asked what work that would be, she answered, you would not understand it now. Sometime after we were settled in Painesville, after I had my music classes established and was able to support my family, I began to feel the pressure of unseen hands on my shoulder. The hand would come suddenly so that I would start thinking someone's behind me and someone had come up, but no one was there. I also would hear my name called. Sometimes my father's voice would be as plain as if he were in the room. I became concerned. Persons who heard voices and felt things that were not there were plainly unbalanced. Maybe I was becoming unbalanced. Maybe I only imagined that I was teaching well and looking after my family. I certain need, certainly needed all my wits, not only to look after the children, but also to plan wisely for my youngest brother, Cal, because I was his guardian. And when it came to me that perhaps someone who had a gift like Dr. Walton's could help me. There must be other persons who were what people called mediums. I went to Minneapolis and asked a friend to help me find a medium. Where on earth would one look for a medium? The classified telephone book proved to be the answer. We found seven names and called on six of them. 
One was ill, one was busy, and some were away. Finally, at six o'clock, we went to the last house. A kindly woman came to the door and she said she was cooking sup supper and never saw anyone at this hour, but that my father had been after her all afternoon, so I'd better come in. Your father says we had an awful time getting her here. She told me to go home and sit in the dark with a pencil and paper and relax so that my father could write through my hand. I did as I was told. Back at my friend's house, I went into the bedroom and closed the windows and doors and blew out the lamp. For a few moments, my hand moved in circles. I wonder if I was actually writing and I lit the lamp quickly. It was blown out. There was no open window, no possible draft. I tried again. This time I seemed to be writing words. So again, I lit the lamp to look, but before I could see my paper, the lamp went out. There was no sound of a puff in it in its going out and no smoke stain in the chimney. It just went out. Remember this was back before electric lights and she had a little gas lamp, a lantern sort of thing that they used back then. A third time I lit the lamp and it went out. Finally, when my hand ceased to write, I lit the lamp again and it stayed lit. The first few lines of my message were about my brother Cal. Although he was only a high school senior, I was directed to send him to summer school at the University of Minnesota. Such a thought had never entered my mind and I was very much excited. The message went on to say that I was not to be afraid because my mother had particularly watched over Cal ever since her death and she had already located a good home for him where he could live until he was through college. Further, that he would become a member of the church attended by the family with whom he would live and eventually would become a deacon at that church. A few weeks later, I was giving careful directions to the time to go to the university, which office to go to, which man to wait for. And I did as directed. And the first man introduced me was Ernest B. Pierce, uh, the registrar of the university. He took Cal into his home and there Cal lived for five years. Cal became a member of the First Christian Church in St. Paul, where Mr. Pierce, Pierce was superintendent of the Sunday school, and Cal is still a deacon at that church. After the first writing, I found it was not necessary to sit in the dark. Each day, I would spend 10 or 15 minutes holding the pencil and usually received writing. Among the writings were many religious articles, some 1,000 to 1,500 words in length. The pencil moved so rapidly that I could scarcely think of the words as they were being written. At first, the writing was always in my father's handwriting, but later there were many different types of writing. Not infrequently, I have since been able to compare the writing supposed to be of a certain person's with that same person's writing when he lived on earth. And the similarity is often striking and sometimes identical. At times, the subjects of these writings were in entirely unfamiliar to me, but I would always look them up and try to verify them. I still have one of those early disclosures which came to me while I was riding on a railway train. It was an explanation of the theory that an entity or an individuality may come repeatedly into experience on earth in the process of growing into the fullness of his nature, his perfection. The text quoted was Luke 117, and he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The explanation compared the personalities, manners, habits, purposes, and life work of the prophet Elias, Elias and John the Baptist and recalled how Jesus had told his disciples that Elias has indeed come, and that they have done whatsoever listed as it was written of him. And the disciples knew that he spoke of John the Baptist. Now, certainly, I had never heard of the theory of reincarnation. But immediately, it seemed reasonable to me that an individual could not work his way toward perfection in one lifetime. Until I met Dr. Walton, I had vaguely supposed that each soul or personality remained static after death, enjoying such good times as he or she merited, or suffering in some fashion according 
to just desserts. Dr. Walton had underscored my conviction that personality did not snuff out with death and had made me aware that personalities go right on being useful in their way and in less restricted habitat. Now I decided that if there was some purpose in each soul's coming into physical existence on earth, the first place, it was reasonable that each return again and again to learn unfinished lessons. I think I was not very critical because the idea seemed like common sense to me. As soon as I reached home, I looked up the word reincarnation in the dictionary and then looked in the Bible to see if the verse was really there. Sure enough, the verse was part of the story of the angel's disclosure to Zacharias. For a long time, I did not actually see my father, but I find the start of a change recounted in these entries in my diary. July 15th, 1909. This evening, after I got into bed, I saw a light, like moonlight, on the chair by my bed. It was about the size of a hen's egg. It would come and go, sometimes staying for several minutes. I felt like my father was present. On July 16th, father writes, you were right about the light. This is the first time that you've been in the proper condition to see such a phenomenon. You will be able to see more now. The light you saw was mine as I sat in your chair. January 17th, 1910, message from father. The thoughts in your heart make so much difference. If you think loving thoughts full of cheer and success, we can get so much more easily to help you to get those things. If you are blue or unloving, you cannot draw to yourself the best things in life. Do not allow your doubts or fears to make an atmosphere about you. You know that God is love and you are his forever. Rest more, rest every way. Drop out fear, worry, sorrow, and rest in peace and love. On July 11th, Father wrote, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. You must trust in God and never allow your heartaches in any way to cause you to give up. We want you for a noble work and you can do it well, but just now the work you have to do is to stand submissive and bear the markings of the chisel upon you. For without these, you will fall short of your goal. These early days of my father's tutelage were days of poverty financially for me. I used to wonder a little why it needed to be that way. He gave me some very practical advice about daily affairs. Indeed, he never let me suffer too much. Then why could he not go a little further and tell me what land to buy or what investment to make so I could be freed from poverty? As time went on, I found part of the answer. The first lesson I had to learn that we have to accept our own circumstances as being necessary for our own growth. I do not mean to accept supinely without any effort at improvement, but to accept creatively, always looking for an opportunity to serve exactly where we are. There are no shortcuts. In my early diaries, I find these entries, November 23rd, 1911. Much of the time we have less than a dollar and one would think we were going to suffer, but we always have enough. And I am sure we always shall. November 24th, today we barely had enough for a plain dinner. I met Mrs. P who looked at me and invited us to her house tomorrow. As she left, she slipped me 25 cents into my hand. I was very much surprised. She must have seen that I would have a long walk and no car fare. On April 18th, had only one pupil this morning and he didn't pay. Had to trust God to see that I had enough money to get home. That particular day, I was teaching in another town. Just before the train time, a former pupil came in and paid up last year's account. My father wrote, you will not need this strain always. Be kind and just to all and serve the Lord with gladness, knowing that after the night of darkness, you will be in, in the beautiful morning light and will rejoice that you were counted worthy to pass this way. Then one morning, it was the last of June, 1911, I awoke to see my father standing by my bedside. When I say standing by my bed bedside, I mean just that. 
He looked like himself, dressed as he used to dress. Since then, he has often appeared to me. Usually his figure is not at all transparent, and yet I would say that it had no weight except when he was talking to me. I'm not dwelling on his books, actually, on his looks, actually, but upon his presence and what he is imparting. Sometimes I only half visualize him. His form is distinct, but his presence is real. All other times I do not see him at all, but I hear his voice plainly. I hear him laugh. Still other times I neither see nor hear him, but his words come to me as impressions, usually in full sentence form. I'm never in any doubt as to its being my father who is instructing me or giving me comfort. I sense his presence when he comes to me just as assuredly as I would sense his presence when he walked into the room during my childhood. That June day, my father said, get up and go to Addie's. We have found an office for you. I recently had come to Minneapolis to hunt for a place for the children and me to live. And as he spoke, I saw a vision of a certain corner, not far from her house, which was then on Nicolette Avenue. As I dressed, he went on to explain that I should know the place because of the joy and peace which would come to me when I stepped on it or stepped into it. The exper expectancy of joy and peace was comforting because I knew I would need it to begin a wholly new kind of work, healing. At that time, the gift of healing or of being used as a healing channel was still very new to me. And it seemed a terrific responsibility to accept patients, despite the startling success I had, had encountered with arthritic Mrs. Wenzel. Yet as my father spoke, I knew I would have to trust the healing power and apply myself to it. Eventually giving up my music, if I expected to be genuinely useful. It was strange how things began to work out for me once I made the decision to begin helping people through healing. That morning, Addie and I went as directed. There were certainly no apartments available in that section of Nicollet Avenue, which I had visioned. The buildings were largely office buildings and too pretentious for my purposes. As I stood on the corner, somewhat dismayed, I looked down a side street and noticed a new building, not as tall as most of the others. We walked over there and found it was not quite ready for occupancy, but the flats were being rented. Eddie and I climbed upstairs and walked to the back apartment, which obviously would be cheaper than the front apartments. There were places for rent all right, but the rooms were dark and looked out against blank walls. I knew I could never work happily in such a place and was about to leave just before I went down the stairs, I stepped through an open door into one of the front apartments. I was only looking through curiosity, not with the remotest idea of living there. But no sooner was I in that room than a feeling of profound happiness swept over me. The room seemed to be my room. I felt completely at home. Joy and peace claimed me, and it was a strange sensation of complete belonging. Immediately, I asked the man who was showing me around how much the deposit would be to, to hold that flat. He said $5. I had only $2 and no prospect of any more that day. Perhaps that week, Addie quickly thrust a $5 bill into my hand and bid me to borrow it. So I paid the deposit, which would hold the flat until the following Saturday. Little money came in that week. On Friday, I prayed to be shown for certain whether I had understood correctly. That day, none of my music pupils took his lesson, but all the patients insisted on paying for their treatments. Although I had never charged for treatments, nor ever before received pay. By night, I had enough money for the rent. Saturday, after paying the rent, I went into the flat and knelt down, asking that the room be filled with power so that all who entered here would be better and happier for having been there. Suddenly, such a bright light filled the room that I was compelled to cover my face. Instructions came to me to give up all my music teachings now and to sit in the office. I had no furniture except a soapbox that the workman had left there and no bunny to buy any. For several reasons, I could not bring what we had used up to now in the little town of Painesville. But there I sat, and happily too. Later that day, I called the home of my psychic friend, Mrs. Lee, who told me that my father had told her 
that I was not to worry about the furniture, but to trust and pray every day for a week that the rooms would be flooded with power from on high. For once I was able to do just that, I had no worry. I was even mildly amused at the sight of myself sitting contentedly on my box. I did not feel idle, but then I was not idle. Intent, insistent prayer is no idle pastime. And I had a feeling that the power it needed in these rooms was all available and waiting if only my longing were strong enough to bring it in. Monday morning when I arrived at the office, meaning the front room of the flat, I found a treating table and several lace curtains left by the door by Addie. Later, chairs came from various sources, also a table, a desk, sheets and towels, rugs and dishes, books and flowers. By the end of the week, I had 14 chairs and the rooms were cozy and well furnished. Nothing had been asked for and the items had come largely from very unexpected places. A man who owned a store in Belgrade, whose daughters had been pupils of mine, came to Minneapolis on a buying trip and hearing of my new venture had dropped by to wish me well. When he went home, he sent me two new tan and green rugs and some furniture as his thank you for the help I had given his family. All the furnishings which came were in the same shades of green and brown. Everything matched, as we say. The senders were not acquainted with one another. They sent notes with their gifts, something of this order. We love you, and we want a little corner in your home. During all the years that follow, I learned from just such experiences to realize that God has all our needs supplied in his storehouse, and I must not depend on any earthly source for supply. Above all, there must never be a thought of commercialism in healing work. Those who are able to pay for my time and have the opportunity of doing their part, but money and healing cannot mix, being on entirely different planes of manifestation. Sometimes I think that same thing is probably true of most services that we render for one another. Each one of us should give all that he has to give, which would establish an economic order in which we were all giving and receiving according to our ability and need. In modern society, I'm sure there is a place for the use of money because it facilitates the exchange of services and some things like food and books. I would not hesitate to buy or sell for cash, but for an individual, no further advanced than I, it is best to offer the healing channel freely, regardless of pay, knowing that some will always pay enough to meet my needs and more. Often people respond to my need just as I do to theirs by giving what they have that may be of help. There was the time early in my work when I was called out at midnight to treat a very sick baby. The night was extremely cold and my coat was thin and unlined. After treating the baby, I was about to start home when the father of the baby, a man about my size, asked me to wear his fur-lined coat the rest of the winter, explaining that he had two fur coats. Everywhere I have found this loving kindness in the hearts of people and I realize more deeply each year that all men are brothers who want to manifest their kinship given half a chance. If I need shoes, shoes come my way. If I need love, my friends come from all quarters to sustain me. Whatever I need comes at the right time. I've learned slowly that there are no unmet needs if we fulfill the conditions which make it possible for us to accept. 